My name is uh, Sherry Honkala, and I'm running for Philadelphia Sheriff. I'm running on a zero foreclosures platform uh, in which if I'm elected, I'm going to refuse to throw families out of their homes. And uh, today, uh, the, the press conference is focused on putting a face on the housing crisis in Philadelphia and in this country. And uh, I want to start with uh, somebody that uh, really inspired me um, to run for the office. I was never interested in electoral politics in my life. And uh, this last year, uh, my sister Anne and uh, my niece Ruby and her other sisters uh, lost their home. And so we're gonna we're gonna start off today by listening to Ruby. My name is Ruby. Um, and I have something to say. I have something to say. People have lost fingers. Wait. Okay. Wait. People, people have lost fingers, so we have to help them. So get them our house. That is true. Good. I don't do that part. <laughs> Now she's speaking on behalf of her sister, Shani. Yeah, I guess she is. Um, <laughs> that we help because we care and we love. I hope you do too. And thank you so much. Sherry Hunkala's sister, and um, like she said, um, going actually, it's almost two year, or a year and a half now that I lost my house. Um, and where do I begin? I had my house for 15 years. Um, I've had the same job for 22 years. Uh, the reason we lost the house is because my husband lost his job, and I couldn't afford it on my income, so we refinanced. And we got tossed into an arm and a balloon payment and all this. But we, uh, we didn't get scared right away because they started talking about um, everybody getting bailed out and taken care of and don't worry about it. And so we went on all the websites and we went and contacted all the branches, Urban League, Habitat for Humanity, all those different things. And for two years, I begged them, and I said, well, you know, we'll do whatever, we'll do whatever it takes. And they would say, okay, but you got to do this, 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 and I'd do it. And then they'd say, no, not enough, you got to do this, 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 this. This went on forever, forever and ever and ever, and I couldn't take it anymore. I was starting to get sick. My kids were sad. So I had to... Let it go. You know, everybody has their their abilities and their strengths. And there were certain things, you know, a lot of people, their strength is to stay and stick it out till the end. And mine was I had to keep my sanity for my kids, so I had to walk away. <coughs> we um, got, still are getting bills from the house that we don't own anymore. We're getting threatening letters because the grass isn't cut. We're getting letters from the IRS because the taxes aren't paid. The house is still not occupied. Um, so even though I cleaned the house spotless, I mowed the grass, I gave the house back to the bank and said, here, take it. If I can't keep it, take it. They won't even take it back. They're still, like I said, keeping me responsible for all the bad things but not letting me enjoy any of the good things. Um, again, there is nothing that we could have done to keep the house except for occupying it, which if I didn't have as many kids, I have five kids. I, if I didn't have five kids, I probably would have occupied it and fought for it harder. I just, I couldn't physically and mentally go through the, the stress and the strain anymore of trying to keep it. 
now we're in the apartment life, <laughs> which uh, yeah, is a whole other sad story, but we'll look <laughs> on. I'm done. Thank you. And uh, next we have uh, Edie Chapman, um, who will say a few minutes about um, the stage and what she's at with her home. In 2006, I bought a house that I kept seeing on the internet that had a theater in the backyard. It was here in Philadelphia, and it was the only time I'd seen that. And when I came to Philadelphia and I actually saw the place, and I saw the group that was renting it, and uh, I knew that I was intended to be the caretaker of the place, at least for a while. <laughs> and uh, I was still living in San Diego and still working as a secretary there. I ended up having to quit my job as a secretary and move here to try and take care of things in person. And uh, all of this started with a loan on my condominium back in California. I took out a, a loan for about $250,000. And that included paying off some bills at the time and also making the down payment on this house here in Philadelphia. They asked for one third down payment for me to be able to get this house. So just about between that and the things that I've done to try and fix it up, I wanted to run a bed and breakfast in the front and keep the theater going in the back. Anyway, at this juncture, uh, I have gone through foreclosure once. And I, I had the option then, back in 2007, to declare bankruptcy or be foreclosed on. Instead, I spent all the rest of my savings of, and my 401k to pay for their attorneys to get out of it and to get a new arrangement for my payment. My loan originally was 13 and a quarter percent, and we worked it down to where I was only paying six on a fixed percent. And that was great. I could actually swing that. It was still almost half my income, but it was I could swing it. And I did. And then in 2011, actually in late 2010, the mortgage company I was with gave my loan to another bank, a New York outfit called M&T Bank. M&T Bank did not continue the first place insurance that we had on my house. And we did not, they did not, um, they instead went and got a broker for about six grand plus, And they also got a new insurance policy that ran around $600 a month. So the total thing was an extra $1,400 on my mortgage payment. It took it from around $1,600 to $3,000 in June. And then they would not accept a partial payment. So I am in arrears each and every month, $3,000. And uh, at this juncture, I just don't know anybody who can afford that kind of a hit. It is impossible for me to pay twice what I was paying. It is impossible for most families to pay twice what they were paying. Uh, I have a lot of circumstances in my life that are working out just fine. Some other circumstances that are not working out quite so fine. But the bottom line is, when it comes to the mortgage banking industry, they have all of the chips. They have all of the power. And I, as I said, I went through a foreclosure where I had to pay all their legal fees. I had no attorney. And I'm just not going to do that again. This time, I have a lot of people who are going to help me fight. And I will. I will. Okay, next we'll hear from Glenn Davis. My name is Glenn Davis. Um, I'm, a, I'm a father of three children, um, ages nine, six, and four. Uh, my house has been in foreclosure now for over a year. Um, I've tried to negotiate with my bank. Um, it's IndyMac Bank, um, now a subsidiary of One West Mutual. And 
my mortgage was only for something before I, um, when I got unemployed. So when I became unemployed, um, and they foreclosed on me and told me <coughs> they wanted uh, $2,000 down and then $1,400 a month. And that's all that they were offering me. And that was all my unemployment, um, and I gave it to them for about four months. And I, I couldn't keep up $1,400 a month. So after that, um, I called them and told them, look, I, I can't continue this. They seemed like they were really working with me. And um, they said, sure, what we're going to do is just give you another payment arrangement. But they didn't tell me that they were going to give me fines of $800 to $900 because I couldn't stay in this <coughs> payment arrangement. So actually, out of that $1,400 that I was given per month, you just set me back almost two months of me getting ahead. You just set me back two months. And they kept doing this. This is not the first time. Uh, that, was, that was the first time. Then it was another time that I asked to redo my loan, and they dropped it down to 966 which is still over double my monthly mortgage. Um, and every time that you get into these programs, you think you're safe, you think you can work it out, and then all of a sudden when you can't and you call them and talk to them, they immediately put you right back into foreclosure. You're never out of foreclosure. You're just on a pay payment arrangement. And when you can't afford it or keep it up, they just push it right back. Okay, well, you know you're in foreclosure. So for me, being in foreclosure for well over a year now, um, it hurts me financially. I can't, I can't get my head above water. I'm always in the rears, month to month. And with the times the way it is right now, everybody losing their homes and, and losing their jobs, we can't pay when we don't have our um, no job. So they need to stop foreclosing on homes right now, especially in, in 2011, in the state that we're going in right now. We need to revamp the system before a lot of us is out on the street. And, and I don't want to be out on the street with my, my two children. It's really hard out here. So. Thank you, Brian. And uh, next we'll hear from uh, uh, a couple other women which will um, move from the foreclosure issue who will also talk about the housing crisis in Philadelphia and additional problems. Some people might be aware or not aware that we no longer have any programs for families that are facing foreclosure. So. Um, uh, if I don't become the next Philadelphia sheriff and stop home foreclosures, then uh, people like Glenn uh, and Edie will be thrown out of their homes because they've already said right now they don't have the money, the banks won't modify their loans, and they will go out. And this is a moral issue, and uh, uh, that's why... Uh, uh, we called uh, Reverend Terrence Griffith, who hopefully will walk through the door any minute, and Reverend Johnson, and then we'll hear from Reverend Adon. Um, so uh, now, uh, Althea Ricks. Hi, my name is Althea Ricks, and I've lived, I've lived in this house that I'm in for 10 years. I didn't know the house belonged to fill up the House Development Corporation. I fixed this house up, maintained this house. Turned this house into my home for how many years? For ten years, and now they want to put me out of this home. I don't know which. I've been doing everything they possibly asked me to do. By when? By well, they want to put. By it could be tomorrow. Right. It could be any day now. So I really don't know. But um, I don't feel as though it's fair. I mean, they just. There's, there's too many vacant houses here in Philadelphia for them to just keep putting people out of them. You know, people are moving these houses, try to fix these houses up, try to maintain these houses, and they just want to put you out of it. And I don't have nowhere to go if they put me out of this house. And I'm, I've done everything they possibly asked me to do to try to keep this house. Now I have Sherry to help me, and we're going to fight to do what we have to do to keep these people in. Are you going to leave your house? No, I'm not leaving my house. Okay. 
regarding the bundling of PHA-owned properties. As people's homes are being foreclosed on, and we have all these vacant properties, PHA, our Philadelphia Housing Authority, is bundling up their properties that are vacant. Okay. 400 properties, and they are selling them to the highest bidder. They're having an auction coming up on November the 16th. They have bundled up these properties, not in smaller bundles, which the average citizen, the 99% of us, could afford, they have bundled them up into as many as 20 properties, uh, 15 properties, just in the heart of North Philadelphia, one of the poorest sections in town. So they have bundled these properties up, public properties, public young properties, into packages that will make them right for the taking by large developers. I thought maybe there would be average developers that we see in the area most often. But today, at the informational session, I queried some of the developers who were there. They even said, and these are pretty st strong developers, they even said these packages are too large. They need to be reduced. Even for them, these are developers that do this all the time. So if they're too large for the average developer in Philadelphia, then certainly they should be uh, unbundled. So I'm here today because the number one uh, fighter <laughs> regarding housing in our community for many years. I met her last evening. I said, Cheryl, I must come out today and talk to your audience about Occupy PHA. We must call state representatives. I'm asking for you to call Councilman Clark. I'm going to hand up these flyers with their numbers on it. And I'm also asking to call PHA, Michael Kelly, the new executive director, who doesn't know the lay of the land in Philadelphia. He hasn't been in this town long enough. I think it's time for we the people to really call some shots, say what we really want. I know this is mostly about foreclosure, but once you property is foreclosed on, you would look to public housing as a last resort. Well, my goodness, they're bundling up the properties here, giving them away, and they give these developers up to five years to fix these properties up. So this is not going to help you. You need housing right now. These properties, have, most of them have been sitting vacant for several years. They have put people out of these scattered sites. Yeah, yeah. And there's a program for folks who lived in these scattered sites to be able to purchase them. That probably hasn't been working very well. So there's a whole lot of issues, but I want to really focus on the fact that these bundling these properties that we're requesting that they unbundle them so the average citizen can partake in the bounty. All right. Thank you all so much. Okay, I don't know. I, um, I know that Reverend Adon wasn't feeling good. Probably still not feeling good. Um, would you like to say something or not? Sure. Okay. <laughs> can we? Hey, hello. Pay attention. Go ahead. This is a, uh, thank you for the invitation. My name's Adan. I'm Presbyterian pastor from the West Kensington Ministry in North Philadelphia. And uh, this is a really complex, systemic uh, problem. And as smart as we are as a society, and as, as we have elected officials, and we have corporations, and we have bankers, and we have a lot of uh, really intelligent people, and as a 
as a pastor, you know, we, we're part of the system as well. But it's hard for me to, to, uh, to connect how law enforcement and the law is connected to, uh, to banks and can put people on the street, families, children. And I have not seen or heard any uh, viable or responsible approaches as to how to approach this. It's a dilemma. It's it's. Uh, I'm a pastor, but this is a this is a. a I think any universal <laughs> religion, any belief, any humanist to atheist, I think we're all on the same page that this is just not right. Um, and it's something that I think breaks God's heart, <laughs> especially as a being. You know, the, we're in the first we're in the first world here, but yet we treat people. And, all, and usually those who are most vulnerable, uh, children, the elderly, those, those with mental health issues, uh, this is the way we treat our members of our society. And I think at the end of the day, uh, <laughs> that's, what we, that's what we will be judged on. In Matthew, the book of Matthew says that when, <laughs> when we meet our Creator, we will be asked to... Did you feed me when I was hungry? Did you clothe me when I was naked? Uh, you know, the, the Shema, our, our Jewish brothers and sisters pray the Shema every day, which says, you know, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul. And then Jesus added, <laughs> and the second commandment is like it, which says, and love your neighbor as yourself. So to put loving God good loving neighbor on equal footing I think that's the command of uh, that Jesus Christ gives us and we are not loving our neighbor we are <laughs> uh, causing them to be homeless so we have uh, a lot of work to do you know John F. Kennedy says the, the journey of a thousand miles begins with one story <coughs> and this is a, a classic David and Goliath story where where there are people in the in the good in the hoods, <laughs> the poor people. We are David, and those that are in a pop, seat, seats of privilege and power, they're Goliath. And we don't try to uh, demonize folks because in the end we're all part of the system somehow. And uh, you know, it relates to what every great leader has has tried to follow, which is their heart which is the, the moral compass, whatever religion they are. And what the words that, that come to me at this moment are, are from Martin Luther King Jr. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. So those of us that have the, uh, the capacity, the privilege, we can't just sit on the sidelines. And uh, it takes courage. You know, uh, all the prophets, if you read the prophets of the Jewish Bible, <laughs> they were crazy. And they, they knew that the fights they were fighting um, were not going to be <laughs> won with the snap of their fingers. But it was going to take work, sacrifice, uh, unity. And uh, I think that's what the seeds of all that are taking place here. And of course, uh, the hard work is divisive. When you stand for something, when you say yes to something, like people shouldn't be homeless, then you're saying no to systems of economic oppression that cause other people to get rich off of homelessness. As a pastor, I can speak all day. <laughs> but this is obviously a... Uh, for those of us who are lucky, this is not a life and death situation. But for people that have children, especially in Philadelphia, we're about to enter another another winter that I'm sure is going to be just as bad as the last one. So this is a life and death issue. This is a an issue of humanity, of all religions. Thank you.
Any questions? Okay. I just I just want to say, <coughs> uh, Reverend Griffith sent me a text. There's an emergency at his son's school. He will still be here. He'll do an interview. Um, so, Jason, if you could get him when he comes. Um, I just want to say that uh, I, I want to thank everybody for coming. I want to thank Reverend Adon for being here and all of these guys for putting a face on the housing crisis here locally and around the country. And if there is not an issue that we can't take a moral position on, I don't know what we can. Um, it's wrong in 2011 to make men, women, and children homeless. There's no excuse for it. I don't care what political party you believe in or you belong to. Um, if we can put people on the moon, if we can build stadiums, if uh, uh, we can do all of those kinds of things, we can stop being about the business of putting men, women, and children out on the streets. Okay, thank you very much. Please, let me just say, this is close, I'm serious. Call council table. Thank you very much. Okay, the fight's just begun.